Hello everybody, uh, my name is Andrew Trollson and I'm going to be giving a little uh, recording this afternoon on a talk that I actually did back in June 2010. It's a re-recording of a talk that I gave at Microsoft. Basically what we're going to do here is we're going to look at um, some of the changes that took place with .NET 4.0 and if you have already been playing with 4.0 you're probably aware that it is a pretty large set of changes that uh, took place. I'm not going to be talking about everything here. I wanted to focus more on the core language changes because both uh, C Sharp and VB did get some pretty nice updates. But then I also want to talk about a couple of brand new APIs. And I actually picked out a few of my favorites. The Task Parallel Library and something called PLink, which you might know stands for Parallel Link. And then we'll wrap up here by just talking a little bit about something that was introduced for WPF called the Visual State Manager. Now, if you have not played around with the new version of uh, the framework, one thing which is a pretty big change is that the help system is now hosted through a web browser. And I just want to pull this up real quick so you can see it. Now that doesn't mean that you have to have an internet connection. You can actually install the framework documentation right on your desktop. Let me just show you how to do that. So we can go to the start button, go under all programs, and then you're going to see the very familiar little blue question mark for the documentation. But as soon as we open this up, it's going to go ahead and launch a local help system. So you'll see that it's coming right here to your your machine. Notice the IP address. And uh, basically right here, .NET Framework 4. This is where you could get to if you want to start to drill into all the different changes throughout the framework. Now as far as getting this thing installed on your machine, all we have to do is go back to the same Visual Studio area. And then under Tools, you're going to find this guy, Manage Help Settings. Now I already have mine installed, but what you can basically do here, if you click Install Content from Online, it's going to go ahead and show you all the different packages that you could install locally. And I, I would recommend if you have the hard drive space, just grab it all, because there's plenty of good stuff on here. So you can just kind of selectively go through add whatever pieces you want and then you'll be all good to go. Now back to our slide deck. So why don't we go ahead and begin by talking about some changes that took place to VB and C Sharp. You know these days it really is very very true that these two languages are extremely similar when it comes to their functionality. There are only a, a very few number of differences these days. Uh, in C Sharp land, we have pointers. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't use them hardly at all. The only time I've ever dabbled with them a little bit was through some complicated interop. But beyond that, they're just not a very useful feature for most C Sharp programs. VB, on the other hand, has something that I really wish C Sharp did have, and that's that nice VB literal syntax. So beyond these two pieces, the languages are really in sync now with the release of .NET 4.0. And here's one example, okay? C Sharp now supports a feature that VB has had for a long, long time, and that's optional parameters. Now, at first glance, it might not appear to be wickedly useful. I mean, it's kind of a neat feature, but I'll show you where it can be really helpful in just a couple of seconds. But here's a simple example of how you could use this. When you define a parameter now, you can actually assign it a default value. And then if that method is called, as we see down here, where you don't specify a supplied argument, that will be used automatically. So basically, we got it set up here so that the uh, programmer cannot find the data, but the CFO cannot find the payroll. So we're just going to be leveraging that optional value. Now one thing which is maybe not obvious, at least it wasn't for me, but the value that you supply to a default parameter, 
it must be understood at compile time. So the part down here in red, you know, when I was first kind of playing around with this, I thought, hey, it'd be nice to have a, maybe a timestamp that would say when the error occurred for the error log. And uh, we can't do that because the now property is not known until runtime. So if you attempted to type this in, you would actually get a compile time error. So that's one restriction. If I can just go back a slide, here's another little restriction here too. All of the uh, optional parameters have to come at the end of a signature. So you can't put them prior to unoptional parameters, which makes sense, right? Because then uh, how, would we able, how would we be able to figure out what was optional or if we were actually just skipping over it? Now here's an example of where this could really be useful. You know, when you're designing any kind of a class, it's certainly not going to be uncommon to have many constructors. So we might do something like this, right? We'd have multiple constructors, and then we can chain them all together, and this kind of delegate all the workload here to the master. So here we'll just use our constructor chaining syntax. Now that's not too bad, but notice how these two constructors right here, they don't really do anything. Right? They're just kind of feeding the data back to the master. So nowadays, with optional parameters, I could go ahead and just have this one constructor that would be functionally the same as what we see over here. Right? Because now what I've basically done is I've just supplied defaults for everything. So if I don't pass in any arguments, I've effectively created it with the default constructor. And then I can specify one, two, or three named arguments as well. So anytime you're doing some sort of a method overload, this is not limited only to um, constructors, obviously, but whenever you're doing any kind of a method overload, now with optional parameters, we can really simplify how we set things up. Now on a related note, C Sharp supports another feature which VB has had for a long, long time called named arguments or named parameters. The idea here is that it makes it possible to invoke a method and specify the arguments you pass into that method in any order you choose. Now, just to do this for the heck of it is not useful at all. Right? If you know that you are trying to call a method that requires a string, a string, and an int, I'll just pass it a string and a string and an int. But I'll show you where this feature can actually be pretty nifty. Really what it boils down to is you can really simplify interop with com. And we'll see how in just a couple of seconds. But let's go ahead and examine how we can do this here. So here's a method. Now notice the parameters that it is expecting, right? First two parameters are of type console color. And then we have a string as the third parameter. Now over here, notice how I'm going to be calling it in a different calling pattern, right? I'll give it the first console color, but then I'm going to give it a string followed by the second console color. And the reason that this is OK is because I've actually named the argument, which we can see right over here. Oop, a little too dark there. <laughs> but you can see what I've done, right? It's just basically the actual name of the parameter with a colon operator. Now, kind of similar to what we saw there with optional parameters, there are a couple of little restrictions. Like down here, if I attempt to specify positional arguments before, then we're going to get into a bit of a problem. So we need to go ahead and make sure that any kind of optional arguments are always listed at the end. Now here's the other big uh, change that took place with 4.0 as far as C Sharp goes. For better or for worse, C Sharp now has the ability to sort of opt in to scripting-like functionality, right? The CLR that we've known and loved for years has a little brother 
called the Dynamic Language Runtime. Okay, this is a new service. And what the DLR is going to basically be doing is evaluating these little packets of data called expression trees. And an expression tree is sort of a um, agnostic request that a code base is trying to make. And that expression tree will be unpackaged and evaluated at runtime. Now, why would we ever need to do this? Well, the places that you'll probably find this uh, dynamic language runtime support really helpful are when you're going to be doing a lot of reflection. You can really simplify your reflection code. And it's also going to be a way to simplify how we communicate with COM objects. And I'll show an example of that, too. Now, there are some other uses of the DLR that I'm not going to go through here. If any of you happen to use some dynamic languages like Iron Python or Iron Ruby, it makes it uh, easier to communicate with those code bases as well. Now, how do we package up this expression tree in C Sharp? Well, we have a new keyword called dynamic. And when you declare a piece of dynamic data, you can assign it anything you want and everything is going to be ignored by the compiler. Remember, this is all going to be evaluated at runtime. Now, similar to an implicitly typed variable, we can go ahead and make an assignment on the code line that declares the piece of dynamic data, but you're free to change it after the fact if you want to, okay? Even if you change it to a completely different type of data. So here, we can see that I'm going to call some methods off of string, two upper. But this one right here compiles just fine as well. And you can see that I've typed in the incorrect case down here. Well, this will be you know, not checked until runtime. So the compiler just says, oh, you're dynamic data. I'm just going to leave you alone. And even this would compile just fine. But clearly, system.string does not have a method named foo, right? So where would you ever possibly use this in a real situation? Because I'm sure you can agree, just defining something as dynamic for, the, dynamic for the heck of it is a pretty poor idea, right? If you don't need to opt into this service, then don't bother. But anytime you are working with COM libraries, and you know maybe today at your company you're not actively programming a lot of COM yourself, but you know there are many very important object models out there, all the Office products that are only accessible through the COM layer. Well, take a look at this signature of a COM interop library method. Right? This is what we would normally have to go through if we uh, did not use these new dynamic services. So notice all of these different parameters to this one method. Everything is you know, an actual optional com parameter. But before we had optional parameters in C-sharp, we would have to specify type.missing, 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 all the way through this signature. And that got really old really, really quick. Well, that problem is taken up or taken care of automatically, right? Because now we can just simply omit it if we don't care about it. But even nicer is that whenever you reference a library, a COM library in a 4.0 project, what you'll find is that any variant data type declared in the COM library is going to automatically be mapped to dynamic. And that's going to really clean up the kind of code you have to write. You don't have to worry about a whole bunch of extra casting. You don't have to worry about these weird hidden com methods you have to call to use an indexer. You can just directly program against the model. And that will, again, really simplify your code base. So I'm going to show you a little demo that will kind of illustrate how this can make life a lot nicer. So let me just go over here to Visual Studio. And let's take a look. Yeah, right here. I already have it open. Okay, so this is a little COM interop example where I'm communicating with Microsoft Excel, but I'm going to do it in two different ways. I'm going to do it using the original 
no dynamic approach. So that might be what we would do for a 3.5 project. And then I'll show you how the same can be done with this dynamic keyword. So let's first of all look at the no dynamic approach. Let me just kind of pull out some of the ugly bits here, right? And I think maybe it'll be helpful if I go to two views. And then up on top here, I'll go to the with dynamic. So I'm going to scroll to right about here. Okay. So notice a couple of things clean up right away. When I'm adding things to my workbook, notice I don't have to specify that dreaded type dot missing anymore. And that comes from the optional parameters. But even better, okay, look at how much nicer this is here, right? Let's say I want to put in some headings in the cells. What this application does is it basically just uh, takes this list and it exports it out to an Excel spreadsheet. So down here, I want to define some column headings, right? If I don't use these dynamic services, look at all the extra casting and levels of indirection I have to go through to set that up. So here would be kind of the old approach. Here's the use of dynamic up here. And we also see some similar cleanup down yonder. Again, notice how much cleaner it is to go ahead and do auto formatting. I don't have to specify all those type dot missings. We can also see it down here as well, right? So just a, a much, much cleaner way to program. And if I were to actually go look here at the Interop library, let me just go ahead and select something for you to look at. Let's see, I'll go here. There we go. So if we start to kind of scroll through, there we go, there's one. Notice how we have the dynamic keyword in place of what used to be a com variant or, you know, in the .NET layer, an object. So this is what's really kind of simplifying a lot of our programming nowadays. And of course, notice here, specifying optional arguments, right? So if I don't specify something here, it's going to default to type dot missing for me. Now one other piece I want to show you real quick here too. And let's see, where did I put that? Oh, that was back in the slide deck, I think. Let me go back over here. Yeah, let's take a look at this too. I also mentioned that use of dynamic services can really simplify when you're working with any kind of reflection service. So, let's take a look at two approaches here to dynamically create an object using reflection. And again, we'll do it with and without the dynamic keyword. So here over on the left-hand side is kind of like the traditional approach of how I could work with reflection to basically create an object on the fly. And then if I want to start to set properties, notice I have to work with property infos. If I want to start to invoke methods, I have to do a method lookup and call the invoke method. And that's not horrible. I mean, that's certainly a lot better than it used to be in the world of com. But now look how much cleaner it is over here if I go ahead and declare things as dynamic, right? Now I can just directly make assignments to properties. And I can just directly make function calls against my dynamic piece of data. So look at all the stuff that kind of got hidden from view. All this goes away, and that goes away too. Now, like any shortcut, there's certainly a couple of gotchas. Remember that anything declared dynamically completely skipped over by the compiler. So when you're typing in dynamic data, you're just going to see a little pop-up appear in Visual Studio that basically says this is going to be ignored. So if you have any typo, if you have any sort of uh, misspelling or extra spacing or the wrong parameters, 
that's all going to blow up at runtime. That's going to throw an exception. There's actually this language binder exception that will be thrown. So that's the, the obvious drawback. But if you use things with a good measure of discipline, you can really simplify the amount of code you have to type. Now Visual Basic also had a good number of changes. Actually in this release of .NET, VB got many, many more changes than we have in C Sharp. So here I want to kind of break down the things that Visual Basic programmers can now make use of. Really, if you already have a background in C Sharp, you've already seen this stuff before, for the most part, because um, the, the features that we got in 3.5 for C Sharp, those are pretty much the same features that VB programmers now have in 4.0. Now this one here in the middle, in red, I think this is the best, <laughs> the best part of the, uh, the language changes for VB. No more line continuation character, that little dreaded underbar that you had to have at the end of a multi-lined statement, that's gone. That alone is fantastic <laughs> because that really simplifies how we work with the lengthy blobs of Visual Basic. So let's go ahead and kind of run through these changes here. First of all, Visual Basic now supports automatic properties just like C Sharp. And if you're primarily a VB person, you might not know exactly what an automatic property is. So let me kind of set, set it up for you. We know that properties are just the standard way to do encapsulation of simple data, right? So over here on the left-hand side, this would be a traditional approach to wrapping up a string, which is representing somebody's first name. Now, if you only need to do this very simple encapsulation, so there's no need for any kind of fancy data validation, you're not trying to do data binding, you're not trying to write to an error log, you just simply want to get and set, yeah, that's a fairly verbose amount of code for just a basic read-write operation. What we can now do in 4.0 is we can declare property just like this. At compile time, what will happen is we're going to get a private backing field added to our class automatically. Now, we don't see that, though. Okay, that's something we don't have direct access to in VB code. And the get and the set for the property will also be automatically implemented for you. So if you make use of this concise syntax, that means you will always have to use the property name to control the underlying data. You know, if we were to take the normal approach, or I should say the traditional approach over here, you know, then we have options, right? If we're actually inside of the class, I could either use my own piece of private data, or I could use the property. But if we use this new syntax, you can only use that property because, again, that uh, private backing field is completely hidden away. So that, that's really nice, right? We can just very quickly whip on through a whole bunch of properties. Uh, one piece which I do like a lot is over here. You can actually give that property a default assignment. And that's something that you can't do in uh, C Sharp. Now here's another nice little feature change for uh, Visual Basic. You might remember that in 3.5, VB introduced something called object initialization syntax. And it was a feature which allowed you to kind of quickly set up a whole bunch of property values at the time you created the object. It was kind of similar to like the with keyword. Okay. Well, now we have an extension of that same idea, and it's called collection initialization syntax. What this lets you do is populate a collection, such as a generic list, with a whole bunch of objects by defining a scope. Right? So once again, VB has the dreaded curly bracket creeping into the language. So this is kind of like um, you know, an alternative to calling the add method multiple times. If any of you have worked with array initialization syntax in VB, same idea. 
except now we're not operating on just a simple array, we're working with a complex object. One bummer about this approach is that you cannot combine object and collection initialization syntax. And that's unfortunate, uh, because if we could, then we could start to write code like this. And that's exactly what you could do in C Sharp. Notice how I'm initializing the collection. And then over here, I'm trying to also initialize the objects. But unfortunately, again, that would be an error in Visual Basic. But this part up here is still pretty handy. So when you're creating your objects, you'll just have to pick an appropriate constructor. And then down here, okay, this is basically the same thing that we saw on the top. But now notice how there is no more line continuation. They're all gone. That's going to be inferred now by the actual uh, environment. So that's, that, again, is probably my favorite feature. Well, I actually lied. My real favorite feature for Visual Basic is that they have real support, complete support for lambdas now. C Sharp was given um, lambda syntax in 3.5, and Visual Basic got a little bit of support for doing lambdas, but before we had .NET 4.0, the support was really limited. Now, before I even go down the changes, I think it's probably a good idea to just talk about lambdas in general, because I think that a lot of programmers are maybe not so sure what to do with these things. So the thing to always keep in mind is that a lambda in any .NET language that supports them, it's really nothing more than a shorthand notation for using delegates. Okay, so if you think about the base class libraries, you know, you'll find plenty of methods that require lambdas as parameters. Or I'm sorry, that require delegates as parameters. So in a traditional approach, we would have to create an instance of the delegate, then create the method that it points to, and then pass in that delegate object to the method that requires it. And that's not bad, it's just a little bit verbose. So what we can do in Visual Basic, or C Sharp, is instead of defining the actual delegate object and then defining the method it points to, I can just inline a method scope right there when I would normally pass in a delegate object. So let me go back to my demos over here. We looked at that in the previous video. And let me take a peek over here at some VB code. Okay, so let's take a look first of all at the no lambda approach. Let me try to explain what's happening here. The list, right, the good old list class. It has a particular method called find all, right? So you can see here I created a list called states. And I'm calling on the list object this find all method, okay? That's been there since the list was first introduced. Now, if I hover my mouse cursor over the find all method, you might be able to see in that little pop up window that find all is asking for something called a predicate. Well, predicate is actually a delegate, it's actually a generic delegate. So if I was not going to use lambdas, look at what I would have to do. Number one, I'd have to create an instance of this predicate object. Into his constructor, I have to specify the address of the method to point to. So that little method right there, examine strings. All I'm basically doing here is I'm just going to pass in each string to the method. Well, actually, the list object will do that for me when I call find all. And I'm just going to see if, that, if the entry has a space in it. So, for example, those two. Okay, so that's what we would have to do without a lambda. And you can just see that what you kind of end up with is a whole bunch of methods like this hanging in your class that are only called under very, very limited circumstances. So now let me show you how we can do that same thing with lambdas.
Okay, first thing I want you guys to all be aware of is that all the action is happening in this subroutine. There is no extra method in my class that I have to point to. Because now when I call find all, I can just in whoops, I can just inline right here what normally I would have to specify in a secondary method, like we saw right oops, up, up here. Yeah, so check it out, right? Instead of having to define this named method, I can just simply inline it now. So the short answer is, anywhere that you find a method that says, hey, give me a delegate object as a parameter, I can now substitute the delegate object with just a fitting lambda. So how do we construct a lambda? Well, you can see that I'm just going to use the function or possibly the sub keyword. So if I wanted that to be a subroutine, I would just have to replicate it throughout here. And then, of course, I wouldn't have a return value anymore. Okay. But here I said I want a function because we are definitely going to get back a return value, right? See that find all method. Remember, he wants a predicate, right? So he says, I can point to any method that returns back a Boolean and then takes a type parameter as an argument. So we get a lot of compiler inference here. Like when I say function s, well, the compiler knows that s has to be a string. You can see that through the IntelliSense. And it knows that because of the way I've configured my actual list. Back up here, right? We have a list of strings. So this lambda syntax is much, much more powerful than it was under 3.5. In the world of 3.5, you could not have lambdas that contained multiple code statements. It could only be for one value. And you also had to always use a function. You couldn't have a subroutine before, but now you can. Whoop, we'll get to that in a little bit later. Okay, so that is also a very, very nice change in the world of Visual Basic. Real support for lambdas. Okay, so that kind of covers the, uh, the bulk of the big changes that took place in Visual Basic and C Sharp. That was the previous video. I now want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk a bit about some of the new APIs that we have under 4.0. And my favorite, by far and away, is this guy right here called the Task Parallel Library. This is basically a brand new approach for building multi-threaded applications. Now, if any of you have worked with multi-threaded applications before, you remember that there's a namespace in MS Core Lib called System.Threading. And that's good. Right? That, was, that was a pretty good toolkit. Nowadays, we have a brand new namespace in MS Core Lib called system.threading.tasks. Right? This is kind of the heart and soul of the task parallel library. Now, the reason that this framework can really simplify how we work with threads is that the CLR is going to be pulling threads as required from the thread pool. So we never have to directly create thread objects and configure them and start them up. When we use the task parallel library, a lot of that kind of work is going to be handled on our behalf. Now, as it turns out, the task parallel library, the API, is making use of many, many, many different delegates in the background. So those little lambda expressions are going to be even more helpful, right? That's going to simplify how we type up our um, task parallel library code. So we'll talk about that first, and then I'm going to kind of complete this part of the discussion by looking at parallel link. And that is where we can build link queries that can now be distributed across multiple cores. So we get that parallel parallelization in a link query as well. So let's go ahead and kind of begin here. Remember that we are 
looking at this new namespace, system.threading.tasks. The key class that you'll probably use a lot is called Parallel. Think of him as the, uh, the guy doing much of the heavy lifting. Now here in this screenshot, I selected Parallel so I can show you a whole bunch of methods here which probably look pretty familiar, right? The for method. There's another one called for each. Well, the way that the uh, task parallel library was designed, and in particular the parallel class, is that it becomes really simple to take a batch of repeatable code statements and run them in parallel. And what you can essentially do is you can kind of retrofit any for loop or any for each loop with a method call in the parallel class. And that's really great. I mean, it makes it just very, very simple to go ahead and um, get some multi-threading for free. Now, just because you can doesn't always mean you should. You know, the task parallel library has a couple of built-in optimizations where if it can kind of discover that your code could actually be slower, it might not actually spin up as many threads as you would think. And there's actually a whole part in the help system that will talk about, you know, kind of making choices on would this be a decent query to run in parallel. So if this topic that I'm going to talk about is interesting to you, make sure you look up TPL in the documentation and you'll bump into a couple of nice little reads there. But let me go ahead and show you an example. If you take a look at the methods of parallel, you're going to find that there are these two delegates that are used all over the place. One of them is a func and the other guy is an action. Really simple actually. What the func delegate represents is an object that can point to a method with a return value. So it's a function. Action is very much like a VB subroutine. It is a method with no return value. So that would be like a void return value in terms of C sharp. Okay, so we could use these delegates directly when we're working with the task parallel library, but you're probably not going to want to do that. It can lead to some pretty ugly code. So again, we're going to favor lambdas. So let's take a look at this code here. Okay. What I'm doing in this code is I'm looping through a collection of files on my hard drive. And they're all bitmap files, or JPEGs, I think they were. Okay. And I'm going to do some fairly labor-intensive work on the image data. I'm going to rotate it. And then I'm going to save it out to a new location on my hard drive. So if I had a folder on my hard drive that had maybe 500 photos, which is not unheard of, and if I were to execute the top code block, my application could definitely be hanging for a long time. Because that would be 500 image files that would have to open up, rotate the image data, and then save it out to a new location. Now, if I want to run this in parallel, look at how simple it is to do. Basically, I take what I've highlighted here in red, and I'm going to substitute it now for a call on the parallel.foreach. Now, this method has been overloaded a number of different times, but essentially, it boils down to two key ingredients. It has to have an enumeration of something. So what's the enumeration of? Well, it's going to be all these files I'm trying to iterate through. Okay, And then it has to have a method to pass those files. So what am I really specifying? Well, I'm using a C-sharp lambda, but behind the scenes, that's really breaking down to an action delegate. So that's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, all I have to do is just literally get rid of my existing for each and plug in a call to parallel.foreach. And then I don't have this uh, code loaded up, but you see I did a little bit of diagnostic work here too. So I'm just going to change the text of the window to show which thread is currently processing the request. Well, up here, I would just see the same number all the time. 
because I just have one thread doing all the work. Here, if I set things up correctly when I call the method, I would see that number constantly flipping on my window because I would have these different threads that were operating on different image files. Now I said in that previous little blob of text if I set things up correctly. Well, here's another aspect of the task parallel library. There's another class called task. And what task allows us to do is it says, I'm going to go ahead and execute a, well, task, pardon the redundancy, in a parallel manner. And the most common reason that we're going to want to use this approach is to keep the user interface thread freed up. You know, whenever we have any kind of a UI control, a button, the text of a window, a text box, if other threads in the application have to communicate with that UI component, it used to require a lot of hoop jumping because, you know, thread affinity is always there for UI components. Well, what I can do nowadays is I can just fire up a brand new task. So this method right here, process files, assume that that's what's going on back over here. As soon as I do that, now my UI thread is freed up. And when I'm back over here, and I'm actually doing things like updating the caption area of my window with a thread ID, I would actually start to see it update now. If I didn't do this part here, well, I would still have multiple threads processing the image files, but that UI thread would never be updated. So that is also a pretty nice little convenience. No more need to worry about um, some other hacks we used to do, like anonymous delegates, or actually just making up more thread objects. Now, the first example that I kind of showed you there with the image files, obviously when you're working with the task parallel library, you might say to yourself, well, I have to do a whole bunch of stuff in parallel, but I don't have a for loop. Right? Maybe you don't have some chunk of code necessarily that you want to execute in parallel. You just want to be able to say, do these three things in parallel, or do these nine things in parallel. Well, when you want to do that, there's actually a different method on the parallel class called invoke. And what he wants is an array of action delegates. So instead of manually making those. Again, I'll just make use of my lambda syntax. So here, I've indirectly defined two action delegates, and they're each pointing to a method that's doing some complex work. Whatever that work might be is irrelevant for this example. But again, just notice here how I have the ability to kind of fire off both of these different methods on different threads now. Now, parallel link is just a natural extension of what we have been seeing. In fact, plink is working with the task parallel library in the background. When link was first introduced in 3.5, part of the way that it got its magic done was through a lot of different extension methods. Remember that an extension method allows you to essentially tack on new functionality to a uh, pre-compiled body of code. So, with 4.0, we have a new class that defines more extension methods. And they're all for the parallel support. So there's a brand new class now called Parallel Enumerable. And probably the most important piece is just as parallel. And that just basically says, hey, I've built up this link query. I'm processing an enumeration of data, and I would like to have as many threads as possible jump into the mix here. Now, both the Task Parallel Library and plink have a built-in cancel framework. So you could also go ahead and set up a cancel token. So maybe, for example, if the user clicks a cancel button, you want all those threads to stop what they're doing and die and go away. Well, that's really simple to set up, and I'll show you a little example here in just a second. 
But here's just a little look at what P-Link might look like. So imagine that I'm here inside of a Windows Forms application. Got a button somewhere in that window. And when they click that button, I want to fire up a new task that is in charge of monitoring that method on a secondary thread. So that's going to keep my UI layer responsive. So what is this method going to do? Well, I just kind of put together a arbitrary example. Let's just imagine I have a really large amount of integers. Okay? And I want to go ahead and build up a link query where I go ahead and find anything where the modulo of 3 is 0. You know, just something that would be fairly processor intensive. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and build up my link query, but notice the extra extension method right here. The container of data, right, so again the enumerable, so that would be our source, so we just are working with a system.array object. Well, that's where I get that new extension method, so much like the system.link.enumerable class, system.link.parallel enumerable, you know, a majority of these methods here are operating on any object which has support for the generic I enumerable interface, which the array class does. So, let me actually show you a little demo. I think I have something here. Mm, yeah, I think this is it. Yeah. Let me just kind of show you a little bit about that cancel framework. All right, so down yonder, and uh, let's start, well, let's start up here. Okay, so inside of my window, I've declared a form level variable, which is this cancel token. Okay, that's part of the system.threading namespace. So he's been around for a while. What this little token allows me to do is to establish, you know, if I want to have this thing, the thing meaning the task running in parallel, if I want things to stop based on user input. So again, that might be like a button click, right? So I'm just going to call it the cancel token. So now, Here's that idea of processing a whole bunch of files in parallel. Okay, so this is similar to what I showed you earlier. Remember the parallel dot for each. Little bit different piece though. Instead of just specifying the enumeration of data and a lambda expression to process the data, I'm also going to pass in something called a parallel options object. So you see, I made one of these guys up here. And that's where I can say, hey, here is the cancel token that I've created. So that was that member variable back up here. Okay. So now that he understands, oh, this thing might be canceled, I'm just going to start to whip on through all those files again. But notice right here, I'm kind of monitoring. I'm saying, okay, well, if we happen to get cancel request initiated, then I want to go ahead and throw an exception. So that's why I have to kind of say, what should we do if the user says cancel? Well, I'm going to throw an exception. Notice how this is all wrapped up in a try, loop, a try block right here. And what am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to simply put a text message on the window that says, okay, we're done processing all your, your files now. And this message would basically say, you know, the process has been canceled. Now, how would I actually cancel it? Well, if I show you the code here, pretty simple. I got a start button. I got a cancel button. So if I click on that cancel button, I just have to set that token, again, that's this guy up here, to cancel. And I don't even know if I have any image files on this computer. Let me just try this real-time demo. you got to love them. Oh, wait, wrong one. <laughs> got to love that, too. 
So we got to go here. So if I have image files on my hard drive, which I don't know if I do, we should see thread IDs change up here. Yeah. Yep, see all that? Now I can cancel. And we can see now that the operation has been canceled. So pretty, pretty nice framework on how we can go ahead and get multi-threaded code into our programs with a suspicious lack of actual threading logic. So I hardly recommend that you check out the Task Parallel Library. Even if you're not using Link at work, maybe PLink is not immediately useful to you, but the Task Parallel Library I think is just great. You can um, really, really simplify how you work with threads. Now the last little piece that I want to talk about here is I'd just like to talk about a pretty nice update that took place in Windows Presentation Foundation with .NET 4.0. For all of you Silverlight programmers out there, you have probably worked with something called the Visual State Manager before. Now the VSM is a way that we can reincorporate visual cues when we're building custom templates. So if you were to make a custom geometry and blend, and then you wanted to say, hey, that geometry should be a clickable button, you could just make a user control out of that, and you would have a clickable geometry. Problem is, you would not have any expected user cues. You know, when a user clicks on a button with the mouse, they expect it to look indented, for example. Well, the Visual State Manager was a way to say, okay, you define these things called visual states. And then within any visual state, you can go ahead and create a storyboard. Storyboards are just an abstraction for an animation sequence. You can then transition to different states, either in code, using a class called the Visual State Manager, or you can also do it in markup with a go to state action. All right, so that's what Silverlight programmers have had since the very beginning. Well, WPF solved that problem with a very different approach using something called the trigger framework. What a trigger is, is basically a way to kind of intercept an event condition in markup, and then when that condition is encountered, then you could execute a storyboard. Well, the trigger framework is still completely supported, but a lot of programmers felt it was a little overly complicated. So with 4.0, WPF now has a visual state manager, which works pretty much identically to what we have in Silverlight. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a demo here that illustrates how we can work with that visual state manager. But also, as you can see on this screen, there's um, some other features that WPF got in 4.0 as well. A lot of them are kind of small beans, you know, things that we uh, probably don't have to get too thrilled about, but um, a couple of nice, nice pieces here. For example, we have a couple new controls, including a data grid, finally. This one here is actually pretty nice. Animation easings are now supported. So we can very easily incorporate physical effects like bounces and springs and snapping. That can be done very simply now too. But for this talk, I just want to focus on the Visual State Manager because that is a pretty nice update. And what I want to do is I want to actually flip over to expression, uh, expression Blend. Now, I'm not sure how many of you WPF folks are using Blend. If you were anything like me early on, I was kind of a self-proclaimed XAML jockey. Now, I'm not saying that I was a complete expert in XAML, but I really felt that I could get everything done if I just typed it all myself. Until I started to do some more complicated things, like making templates or working with animations. Then the amount of code that I had to work by hand was uh, pretty bad. So I finally decided to dive in and check out Blend, and I was a little bit resistant, that's for sure, but the more and more I played with it, the more I fell in love with it. You know, these days I think that blend is actually pretty essential 
for any large scale WPF or Silverlight project. So here I have a project opened up in Blend. It's a little jackpot game. Some of you might recognize this from my C Sharp book. So let me go ahead and just run it first so you can kind of see how it's going to look when it's all done. So here I have a little custom control. And you can see when I click on the star, I can go in and out and it changes the visual states. Right? Well, these little visual cues, that little bouncing effect and so forth, that's all being done through the Visual State Manager. So let's take a peek at what's going on here. I got two projects opened up in Blend. They're both interrelated. This project over here, that's just for this little spin control. Okay, I'm basically randomly flipping through one of three images. We can see that I basically have a bordered image. And then inside of the code, nothing too crazy here, I'm just dynamically picking one of those three images. And then I have a method on my custom class called spin, where I just start my storyboard. Okay, so that part's not too, too crazy. And that's not even about the Visual State Manager yet. That just describes what's happening in this library. So, this is the actual Windows application, which is referencing this library. And here is the artboard for this custom layout. This guy right here, okay, this is the class which is going to be working with that Visual State Manager. So let's go ahead and check him out. It's called the Star Button. Okay, so I have a little designer for this particular button. And uh, my artistic skills are not probably even good enough to draw this star. <laughs> so just in case you're not aware of this, if you were to go to the Assets tab, there's actually a whole bunch of these predefined shapes now. So I actually nab my star from right here. This is a new feature for Blend 4. So you can find a lot of these built-in shapes. And these are actually instances of something called a rectangular polygon class. So that's all this guy is. If I take a look at the markup, again, really nothing fancy when it comes to declaring the shape, right? I just have this regular polygon. We can see down over here I have my data. And I did handle three events. Okay, inside of those three event handlers, okay, that is where I'm going to be communicating with the Visual State Manager to tell it to look different ways based on what I'm doing. So if the mouse has clicked down on the star, I want to start one animation. If it enters or exits, I want to start different animations. So again, if we just look real quickly at the running program, you can see how when I go in or out of that star, just a real subtle change of color. And if I click it, oh, kind of happening too quick. You can see it bounces there a little bit. Well, those are the visual states that I defined. And check this out. Okay, all of this code, oh, markup, all this markup right here, this is the kind of stuff that you just don't want to have to type in by hand. You know, Visual Studio has no support for building animations. There is no animation editor. So if I wanted to achieve the same thing, I'd be typing all that myself. And it's not like the end of the world. It's just pretty grungy XAML. So that's, that's a great example right there about where Blend can really make your life a heck of a lot easier. Because all that selected markup was actually generated using this guy. Okay? Now remember, what a visual state is, is it's nothing more than a named um, condition in your control. So what I did, and I've already done that here so I can't show you from scratch, but basically you can begin up here by making a new state group. So I just call it the mouse state group. Now you can give these guys any name you want. It's just going to refer to a name you can specify in code 
to say yes when this happens do a certain thing okay so I got one called mouse enter star mouse exit star mouse down star I could have called that foo bar quas that wouldn't matter okay so for each one of these visual states what you're essentially going to do is you're going to make a brand new storyboard right so up here you can add the state that's how we get this guy here and if any of you have worked with the storyboard editor of blend before that's what we see going on down here right so I can pick a state open up the storyboard for it so here see that little bounce effect towards the end okay that's what I put together on my storyboard I could make it more dramatic just to make it look even a little more interesting I could maybe rotate this if we do this now right so as I'm as I'm building up the animation right so this, this is what I'm basically saying start this animation when the user navigates to this state now a couple of other cool things about this little states editor every one of our visual states can be given a transition value so I said here I want to take approximately two seconds right for the entire transition to occur other great things too I can incorporate right here my easing functions so I could give it a bounce effect right I could change the way it kinda moves on an arc I can make it elastic I could also incorporate some effects blur ripple slide in okay so as I'm working with this editor remember what the tool is doing right it's capturing all this markup and now I have even more markup than I did previously because I also put in that rotation so let's go ahead see that little exclamation point by the way if you ever see that in blend it just means you got to rebuild because that was the out-of-date image so if I do a control F5 here hey look at that now we get a much more interesting visual effect Isn't that nice so once I define these states how then can I actually transition well that's also pretty simple let's go look at the code behind the star button all right there it is visual state manager dot go to state so this is where I'm just gonna basically say okay go to this state use the transition times if they were specified and who has the state well it's me right so we have these three parameters basically the control that has the state defined the name of the state and if you want to use transitions so again here notice mouse down star mouse enter star mouse exit star those are the exact same names that we saw back over here so pretty nice right so this little states editor you know it looks a little weird right now because you have to do things like define um, you know the direction of the transition just think of your basic state machine right you're over here and you're going to go over here now right just connect in the bubbles with a little arrow so we have to kind of set up which transition we're trying to go to but beyond that working with the actual transition is just a matter of working with your your basic storyboards and this editor I think is much easier than the old trigger editor which I thought was a bit a bit clunky especially when you start to work with things like property triggers and whatnot so WPF programmers now basically have two different approaches on how they want to play around with visual states you can fall back to the original trigger framework or you can use this nice new visual state manager which again is the preferred way to do things in Silverlight so if you were to build up the same jackpot game in Silverlight you wouldn't even have the option to use triggers you would be using visual states all along.
So uh, that was one of my favorite changes for uh, WPF4, the ability to work with visual states. So that's really all I wanted to say for these um, video treatments here. It was just kind of a, of a way for us to take a little look at some of the nice changes that took place in 4.0. And like I said at the beginning of video one, this is a re-recording of a talk that I gave a while back. So hopefully you've already had a chance to play around with some 4.0 features at work or at home. Just to kind of wrap up these different videos here. Video one, we were talking about the changes that took place in C Sharp. So remember we had the dynamic language runtime and we had optional and named parameters. And then in Talk number two, video two, talked about VB changes and the task parallel library. And then here, we talked about Windows Presentation Foundation, and we took a little tour at the Visual State Manager. Now, remember what I said at the start of um, the first video, right? The topics that I've shown you here in no way, shape, or form talk about all the framework changes. For example, WCF and workflow both got some good updates as well. Uh, when it comes to workflow it wasn't just a good update it was a complete rewriting. <laughs> some of you might know that uh, workflow under 3.5 it was a pretty interesting technology but it definitely had a couple of blemishes and 4.0 really went a long way to clean up some problems. Now we didn't talk about those topics in this talk. That might be the topic for another talk someday. But anyway, if you would like to get a hold of me, remember my name is Andrew, and there's my email address. It's just A. Trollson, so a very good Minnesota name there, A. Trollson at intertech.com. Go ahead and drop me a line, and I'll be happy to uh, talk with you about some 4.0 things. Thanks, everybody. Bye.